very much. Good afternoon. Yes, I do have a lot of acronyms in my title. Um, I'm hopefully going to explain all of those and show that they are a sequence and that uh, we do progress from the Merseyside Archaeological Society all the way through to the HER, which is where I work now. So we heard yesterday um, from Mark Adams, Rob Philport, and Jill Chitty the, the kind of the foundation story, if you like, of how the society came into being, that sequence of events that triggered the, the, the initial work, the, the loss of Old Hut, the excavation of Utree Farm, and eventually this site, the, uh, the law courts, and the excavation of 1976, which was, if you like, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, that uh, finally sent up the cry of something must be done. Uh, and what was done was, as we heard, the foundation of the society. Now, I have uh, an additional source to add to all of that, which is um, the handbook number one, a uh, rather catchy title, from the Archaeological Survey of Merseyside, which contains in the, uh, the first page an introduction written by one P.J. Davy, chairman of the Merseyside Archaeological Society, uh, December 1977. Um, and it repeats that, that foundation story that we've heard before, but it goes on beyond that to, to give us a lot more information about what the society was actually set up to do and what it then went about doing. And it opens uh, after the 4th of December 1976 with the, the statement that one of the first actions that the society did was call for a meeting. Um, and one with a hell of an agenda title, which was How the Problems of Merseyside's Archaeology Could Be Solved. Um, this took a while, evidently, because it says by spring 1977 and a few more meetings, uh, the idea for the archaeological survey of Merseyside was starting to come into focus. And it was therefore the MAS which was driving forwards as the, the catalyst, as the, the champion and as a campaigning organisation for what was to become a, a fundamental piece of work of archaeology for, Merse for Merseyside as, a, as an entity, but also as a, uh, as a new resource, as a, a, a planning tool, actually. And this is quite unusual. I want to stress this as we go through. And indeed, he wrote that the object would be to carry out a comprehensive survey of the county so that future rescue and research could be properly planned. And that's quite unusual. That, that's not the sort of goal of a, an archaeological society, usually. This is the sort of activity that you'll get from um, a central government office or a uh, planning department or a museum, not always from a, a local society. And so um, they managed to, to get the ball rolling on this and on the 1st of October 1977 Brian Shepherd was appointed as the first field archaeologist for Merseyside. Now to put this into a, a national context, we heard yesterday from Norman Redhead about all the legal um, various uh, instruments that we have now and the way that the system works now and a little bit about the history of where that started to come from. And at this time, 1977, there was no real legal footing for archaeology in the planning system. We had scheduling, but there's no, no requirement for any work to take place ahead of development. We have to wait until 1990 for that really to come into place. So there's this trend developing at the time called rescue archaeology with the realisation that sites were being lost that they were valuable and archaeology needed to take place ahead of that work. Um, looking elsewhere, we had the, the Walsh Committee of 1969 which suggested it was a local government responsibility that they should be doing this sort of work. And that hadn't really progressed a lot further than that. It, it was very piecemeal in how that was taken up. But there were efforts going on elsewhere in the country to create these archaeological surveys to take account of what was known already and to start planning to identify sites of potential and of particular interest that should be focused upon when development did go ahead. Um, the first of those was Oxford. Uh, the sites and monuments records and the HERs as they are now, the historic environment records, trace their origins back. We regard that as the first one. Uh, 1965 to 67, um, the museum service in Oxford started to uh, conduct a survey of all the known archaeology in the county, pulling that information together for the first time into one place. Now that was um, a groundbreaking idea because there hadn't really been that sort of effort to collate information prior to that date. Uh, we had the Ordnance Survey um, operating in, from the 19th century, putting crosses on maps and saying site of a castle, and, but it was only until uh, 1947 with the foundation of the Ordnance Survey Archaeology Division that they started recording the information behind those crosses. Why did they know that cross went there? 
How did they get that information? Where did it come from? Where could you go to find more information about that? So this trend developed into the Oxford uh, model, which uh, was described as still a work in progress in 1972, uh, when the seminal article about sites and monuments records was written. But it was part of a growing trend across the country. Um, there is a, a national history of historic environment records, which is being processed at the moment and created. Um, I think we're probably going to see something from it published maybe next year. But it's quite interesting as the process has gone on, lots of HER officers have started talking to each other and saying, well, when did your service get founded? Who did what when? Who did it where? What techniques did you use? How did you go about building the record? What have you got now? What's left from those early days? And it's surprising how little uh, institutional memory there is in some places. Um, the, the work that Jill's been doing on the, the history of the Merseyside Archaeological Society is very similar but uh, you've had the advantage of um, lots of minutes of AGMs and things like that. And in some cases, there just isn't that history for the, for the SMRs. We don't really know quite as, many inf uh, as much uh, foundational information as we would like. So it was going on elsewhere. Other counties were doing... Sorry? That's because the microphone stopped working. That's turned off. Oh, fine, I'll just shout. Right. Okay, where did I got to? Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yes, right. So, the unusual thing is, with that national uh, kind of drive towards sites and monuments records being created, and um, this, it, it was out there, this idea was in progress, people were doing this work, this book does not contain the word or phrase SMR, or sites and monuments record. It doesn't appear. This is very much about the archaeological survey of Merseyside, how to go about collecting that data, how to store it and how to retrieve it. And the idea of what it would become after the collection process had finished is strangely absent. It's not included. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, um, but there's another couple of oddities as well at the same time with the archaeological survey of Merseyside. Firstly, it was only interested in pre-1750 archaeology which for um, Merseyside is uh, confusing to say the least um, from a modern perspective. Uh, pretty much Liverpool is post-1750. So you kind of wonder what they were looking for. Um, it seems to have been a short-lived restriction on uh, data uh, collection because um, very quickly they did start recording other things and they perhaps realized how limiting that was. But that is a product of the uh, the, gen uh, the nature of archaeology at that time. There wasn't a lot of interest in post-medieval archaeology at that date, and there certainly wasn't a lot of interest in industrial archaeology, which is the two things that we've got the most of. So they, it was part of a national trend of that interest taking over and being developed. Now, what did the archaeological survey of Merseyside actually entail then? An awful lot of data collection, as you can imagine. Uh, lots and lots of paperwork, poring over historic maps, going back to the record services and going through their archives, what they'd got, museum archives, published journals, um, antiquarian reports, chance find discoveries, collating all of that information into one place for the first time, making it accessible. It also involved, and this is quite unusual, a lot of field work. Now I think it's, uh, I need to do some more research on this, but I think that the Archaeological Survey of Merseyside leading to the creation of the Sites and Monuments record is an unusual model. I'm not sure that there are many other instances around the country where, first of all, an archaeological society, a local society, not a government department, local or national, or a museum service, was instrumental in the creation of the actual uh, the resource, the database that was being created, and certainly not to the extent of parallel field work being carried out to test those results from the map-based information that was coming in to create the SMR. And there's some other unusual things which went on the time as well, which is, well, wearing a fur coat to do an archaeological survey. <laughs> Very unusual. You don't see that anymore. But there's lots of hands-on actual sampling of buildings, recording to very high standards, um, visiting sites which were not regarded as of archaeological interest in many other parts of the country at that time, and making these very, very important snapshot records of the area, the entire Merseyside, at that um, narrow window, and providing what is now an invaluable photographic and drawn record of historic village cores of many buildings which have 
gone through various phases of uh, redevelopment. This, this one is still here, that is now a house. Um, but it's agricultural buildings as well as industrial buildings and domestic buildings and pulling all of that information in and collating it via fieldwork. And they seem to have got pretty much everywhere in Merseyside. And they were on hand to record some buildings in very precarious states um, of their, their history. You wouldn't know from the, the outside of this building now that it had been reduced to this state at one stage unless you had access to the Merseyside Archaeological Society and Archaeological Survey of Merseyside data. And there, there's this problem with that in that I can't always tell who was doing the work. The acronyms um, aren't always used because there's a lot of crossover between the individuals. Sometimes it's, it's clearly an ASM project and sometimes it's a Merseyside Archaeological Society project. And sometimes it's both and sometimes it's not clear who's doing it. But they were there and they were recording these buildings and sometimes literally at the moment of their destruction and loss. This is actually one of a sequence of photographs, and um, you can just make out this man here. He was also holding a prop, which was lowering this cruck frame to the ground, which was being held by two men with ropes up the top. This is not how you do it now. <laughs> and he has dropped his because he's just realised that the top of the cruck frame is coming towards him. Yeah. <laughs> These two then run out of the way in the next frame as well. It's a brilliant photograph. But there's another earlier photograph of this man standing on the roof with a pickaxe destroying the rafters which is um, a phenomenal record. And we wouldn't know that this uh, asbestos, cast iron and brick building was actually a cruck frame barn without these photographs and these drawn records produced at the time. So it's a fantastic resource. And we really do owe a lot to the team who were manpower services staff um, with one professional field archaeologist to start with, going out and making these records, collecting this data and bringing it all back to the office. So what did they get out of all of that? An awful lot of paper. This is uh, one side of my office, and it's just full of filing cabinets, rammed full of tens of thousands of pieces of paper, all of which is controlled by this card index system in the middle. It's a very physical experience using the Sites and Monuments record. You have to scurry around the office, pulling different drawers open, checking different things, because it's all organised by um, a, a map-based indexing system, but also by a township-based filing system. So you have to know the historic townships of Merseyside, which many people have no idea which township they live in because it's a, a very defunct um, local government or division. So moving between the areas, uh, you have to hop around the office to use it. Well, what do you actually find when you get into the right folder and you pull out the right thing? We have P-sheets, which is the published information. Uh, so that's the, the historic journal articles, the, um, the information from uh, articles and journals and uh, historic records which have been you know, properly published and written up. Then we have the F-sheets, and they often contain little things like this, the, the treasure maps, saying that I visited the site on this day, there was a trench out the back for the uh, extension that was being built at that time, I went round, had a look in it, this is what I could see in the bottom of it. And that's all we've got for some of these sites, but cumulatively, fantastic resource. And then we have the, the more substantial excavations. This is Irby. It's, it's a folder round full of these sheets and these sheets. And all of these are pinned together with the overlay mapping, which is um, quite simply a dot on a map with a number inside an OS grid square, and these are the township boundaries. And that's the way in which you access the data. You find out what's known for a given area. You look and you see and there's a cluster of dots there. I need to go and find those numbers in this township folder. But rather unusually, they also had something which was a bit groundbreaking. They had a computer. They had the University of Liverpool's um, ICL1906S, which was a computer first released the model in 1973. So it was getting on a bit already by the time they were using it. But quite importantly, this is perhaps the third oldest computerized SMR in the country. Um, Norman Redhead in his paper yesterday was talking about computers as being a, a feature of the SMRs of the 1980s but Merseyside was definitely ahead of the curve in this respect and they were collating data and accessing it via a computer system. Now it has a number of shortcomings. Um, it can only contain so much information because computing at that time was what it was. It is certainly nothing compared to what we've got today. You know, each of you with a phone in your pocket has more computing power than what was running this information here. And indeed, 
The shortcomings of the system were noted at the time. Brian Shepard wrote, It is both costly and unnecessary to use the computer to retrieve simple groups of information, such as details of all sites known in a particular area, as their index cards would be filed together. However, if the question involved details of sites with specific characteristics, then use of the computer would be justified. Now that's a, a very different time frame that we're talking about there. The idea that you wouldn't use a computer because it's difficult and costly is just alien to us now. And that's just an emphasis of how much has changed in 40 years for the way that we think and the way that we work and the technology that we have available to us. So this is one record. Um, what we have here, someone has done a search on the 14th of September, 1982, at 29 minutes past three in the afternoon. And this was not an area search, because Brian had very clearly written down instructions that was not to be done. Instead, this was all of the Romano British records recorded in Merseyside. And it runs for quite some meters. And then they just press print. What we get for the individual record is that it's Romano British, it's in Wirral, Hillbrae Island, it's a find, and its unique identifier is 1887-4, and that's its coordinates. And that's really it. That's all you can store in this system at that date. There's, it doesn't even tell you what the find is. You have to then go and go back to the paper system to get that information, because the computer at this stage is just another form of index. Now, a couple of things changed during the 80s. Um, firstly, the service moved out of the University of um, Liverpool and came across to the museum. And it started being referred to as a sites and monuments record. That, that language starts to creep in in about 1980, 1981. So they'd realised that they've, they've finished the archaeological survey and they've created something. And that something is a sites and monuments record. It was then maintained um, with additional work going on, but not on the computer side. The new stuff that was being added to the system was still paper, it was still going into the paper maps, more dots were going on those overlay maps, and new records were being inserted into the computer, but still in this format. Indeed, in 1987, it moved across to a DBase 3 Plus system, and in the late 90s, it moved across to Microsoft Access. And then in the early 2000s, it moved across to HB SMR, which is a piece of software I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. But the important thing is, in each of these migrations, when it moved home, when it changed the person who was running it, when it changed format of which computer system was uh, st saving the data, this data did not change. It was still a computer index. And this is parallel to a lot of very important changes to the way that archaeology in general was being recorded at the same time. The professionalization of the service meant that a lot more detail was coming out. We were getting grey literature reports now, short publications of which maybe only a handful of copies were ever printed, containing a lot of high quality archaeological information in a very uh, fine format. But that information couldn't be reflected in the computer database that they had available. So there were limitations which just don't exist anymore. This is the same record. There it is, 1887 slash 004. Um, what you're looking at now is what happens when we press print nowadays on one individual record. And you can see that we can just store a great deal more information. This is the change and advances that we've seen in computing in 40 years. So we've got all of the sources with the actual full bibliography and we've got text, actual text telling us what this is, so we now know that it's a series of brooches and buckles and a glass bead found on Hillbury Island. This is worlds apart from that original 1970s information that they were able to store. And it's all thanks to this software. Historic Buildings, Sites and Monuments Records, HBSMR. This software is different for a fundamental reason. It's designed by archaeologists, for archaeologists, and it is for storing specifically archaeological information. That's the big the game changer that's happened. We now have this technology available to us so we can store archaeological data in a format that is designed for it. We're not having to use the uh, existing ability to record data, which is, I'm not sure what the University of Liverpool computer was used for previously, but it certainly wasn't archaeology, and they were shoehorning the archaeology into the existing structure that they had available to them. And you can see from this that, well, we've just got a lot of different ways of storing data. Monuments, events, sources, finds, consultations, designations, historic landscape character, and even the people and organisations who are doing this work. This is just 
so much more information that we can pour into this system than they could have ever even dreamed of in 1977. Going into an actual record, there we go. <laughs> this is uh, Birkenhead Priory. And you can see that we've got this system of tagging the record so we can say what different types of activity it is and the dates for it so that we can run searches against this. So if somebody comes to me and says, I want to know about all of the uh, Tudor houses, this site will pop out because it has been tagged and the record has been created with all this additional information. It's also got all of the finds information attached to it uh, with a little gold coin symbol indicating it, which is uh, ironic as this one actually is a gold coin. And that information as well means that we can, we can supply far more information far more quickly back to the people making inquiries about the HER than you ever could previously with the old paper system. It's gone from a, a search of the SMR taking a day or a week to taking 15 minutes. That's, that's the level of, of speed and change that we've seen. Behind this, we have what is known as the long description. And in the case of Birkenhead Priory, it really is very long. Uh, we've got up to source 13 showing on the screen, but this actually goes all the way on to source 40. There's a lot of information that you can have available at the, just a press of a button now. Not all of the P sheets were able to be as detailed when we entered in, into the system, though. Some of them are a little thinner in terms of detail. So, well, that's it. That's all we've got. We had lots and lots of records like this, but we were able to enhance the records as they were going into the system. So, I should explain that the, the digitization process that we've been running then for the last two years was as, as a result of uh, the Merseyside Environmental Advisory Service taking on responsibility for the HER. One of the first things that happened was um, English Heritage, as was, came in, reviewed the data and said, well, this is still the computer index from 1982. This needs to be upgraded. You're, you're 20, 30 years behind the rest of the country now. So we need to move forwards and we need to do it quickly. So they uh, employed an HR officer, which was me, and uh, a project officer as well, which was Dana. And the two of us have spent two and a half years processing all of that paper, essentially turning the Archaeological um, Survey of Merseyside into a modern computer database. And the end result, we'll get to in a minute, but we had resources available to us that just nobody could have even dreamed of in 77. We had historic mapping, digital high quality images available online for free. We had rectified historical mapping as well with sliders so we could make it transparent just to check if is this directly on top of the right site, are we looking at the right information. We had tithe maps with the information for what the plot number is, so this is a house and garden, number 49, owned and occupied by Richard Bird in 1844. They had access to the tithe maps when they were doing the original work, but it was physical, it was paper, it was stored away in Preston, in the case of the Lancashire stuff. So copies had to be made. They were relying on second-hand data. Um, and this introduces error, it's, it's unavoidable. But now we've got that version immediately accessible to us, far higher quality than the original survey could have possibly hoped for. We've got historic mapping, which can be loaded into GIS, so we can display spatial information very, very quickly. We can show how areas have changed, what's come and what's gone. And this is the end result. As of Thursday, I think it was, we have 11,898 records on the HER for Merseyside. Now you'll notice that the, the top two here, buildings, and the bottom one, sites, those are the two main divisions. So that's above ground and below ground. But you'll also spot that they're about 50-50. Now I think that's a slightly unusual makeup for an HER. Um, you usually have a lot more archaeology in a Sites and Monuments record than you have built historic information. The reason for that, I think, is because of the work done by Merseyside Archaeological Society, going round those villages, taking photographs of those buildings, drawing those elevation drawings, and doing that historical research on the standing structure. MAS was uh, ahead of the curve, as was the ASM, in that interest in the built historic environment record and getting that information captured at that time. And that's what it looks like today. That's the GIS of the, the HER, if you just turn it on. It looks pretty much like we've got stuff for everywhere, um, and it's, large, it's quite difficult to use at this scale. But if we start to zoom in, you can see that this is different from those overlay maps we were working with in the 70s and 80s, in that we can record information in the GIS that is visually immediately accessible, so that you can start to, start to read the data just from even this. You don't have to open the, the text with it. You can see that there are definite clusters of activity. 
that's Liverpool there. You can also pick out things like Port Sunlight. You can also see historic routeways through. You can see large landscapes, listed landscapes, parks and gardens there. But as well as that, you can see the blue triangles. Those are non-listed buildings. We've got a lot of them recorded and you can pick out the historic cores, where all the villages are, where all the farms are, even at this sort of scale. And that just wasn't possible previously with that old mapping. You can also see the green flags. These are chance discoveries, field walking finds, metal detecting finds, that sort of thing. And you can see large gaps. Now, it doesn't mean that there's nothing in those gaps. It possibly just means that nobody's looked in those areas. So already we can see differences. We can see quality of information from this sort of scale. If we keep zooming in, we can see the reason for some of those gaps is lots and lots of housing went in very, very quickly at a period before archaeology was even a thought in some cases. So we've lost our opportunity to investigate those areas in as much detail in some cases. But it also emphasises, if we keep going in, that there are definite cores of interest. So this is Hamilton Square in Birkenhead. And we can see that, well, all of the listed buildings are recorded. But if we get outside of that core, we've got some buildings recorded and industrial archaeology as well but not a lot. There's more that can be done. There's more information that's available out there that isn't yet in the HER. I want to come back to that in a minute. But the biggest change by far, not only the, the, the quality of information that we can put in and the way in which we can record information, is the accessibility it provides. Working from my desk, I can very quickly look up anything I want to in any area of Merseyside. But now, for the first time, it's freely available online to the general public via the Heritage Gateway. You don't have to come down to the museum anymore to view the data. You don't even have to come to Bootle to view the data. It's there. It's free to use. Please use it. <laughs> There's a lot of research that can be done, a lot of corrections, a lot of checking, a lot of um, validation that can be done by local groups and volunteers who can come to the website and check that data remotely and then feed back into me because I want to hear from you. I'm very, very keen that the, the HER continues to grow that we get more information coming in and that we correct what's already on there. It can be enhanced. In some areas, we've got very, very little information about buildings, and we know there must be more. We just need you to tell us about it. So, the future, where do we go? Our next big step is the grey literature. Um, we've got 30 years of professional archaeological reports, none of which are on the system yet. No idea what could be in any of them. It's, it's a wonderful, untapped resource. That will all be processed, that will all be added to the HER, and in due course will be uploaded to the website. Because the whole purpose of an HER, going back to that original mission statement, uh, if you want to call it that, from the MAS, was that it was to plan research and excavation, to make sure that archaeology was considered during development. And that is still today the majority of my work, that's what I do, I'm part of the planning system. I talk to planners, we talk to developers. But the other fun function that an, uh, an HER does is that it disseminates information because what's the point in paying for archaeology to be done if nobody ever gets to see the results? It's all very well printing out a, a grey literature report which comes to my desk and I get to read. I'm very appreciative of that. But that information needs to go further. It needs to be uh, to reach out beyond just the professional interest to tell people what's been found in their local area. And it's through the Heritage Gateway that we make that possible. We've then got enhancement projects. Um, I know there are local interest groups with all sorts of specialisms. Um, there's all sorts of uh, historical areas which have had um, local societies looking at them for 50 years in some cases. All that information can come in and I want to hear from local societies if they've got information that's of interest, it can go in the system. I'm very, very happy to, to add that information. You can even come and volunteer. Um, we have a computer terminal in the office that you can come and work on. We pay travel expenses within Merseyside, public transport rates. Um, but we want you to come in. We will provide full training. We have more work than I can ever possibly do. So please, come and help me out. And corrections and improvements. Sisyphean task. It is always work that can be done to the HR. There's always a way it can be made better. So if you are using the Heritage Gateway, which I please do use, and you spot something wrong, even a typo, tell me about it. I want to make the HR better. I want to hear from you. Please use it. Thank you.